Knowledge Management Primer Knowledge management is a discipline and business practice that rose to prominence in the business community in the early 1990s and has been growing in popularity in library and information science curricula for at least the past decade, with several programs offering specialization streams dedicated to this topic. If this dream was not available to you at the time that you attended library school, or if you're considering studying or engaging in knowledge management in your current studies or work, this presentation will provide you with some background information on some of the key concepts and practices behind knowledge management. Allow me to introduce myself before we continue. My name is Melissa Fraser Arnett, and I'm a PhD candidate in the Queensland University of Technology, San Jose State University Gateway PhD program. The objectives of this presentation are to provide a definition of knowledge management, to explain the importance of knowledge management in organizations, to provide you with a basic understanding of the concept of knowledge, to describe the history of knowledge management research and practice, and to provide you with some advice on how knowledge management programs can be implemented in your work organization. There are numerous definitions of knowledge management, but they generally refer to a set of practices or processes that facilitate the creation, capture, organization, and dissemination of knowledge. Some scholars also emphasize that knowledge management involves changing the organization's present pattern of knowledge processing to enhance both it and its outcomes. Knowledge management has also been described in terms of specific practices and tools. These practices, processes, and tools that are commonly associated with knowledge management are benchmarking, knowledge audits, best practices, communities of practice, and others. In order to make sense of this definition, you have to have a clear understanding of what knowledge is and the processes by which knowledge flows through an organization or between individuals. So why is knowledge management important to an organization? Practitioners and researchers have identified many benefits of knowledge management for both individual employees and for organizations. A few popular examples include the benefit of helping people to do their jobs and save time through better decision making and problem solving building a sense of community within the organization, driving strategy, increasing opportunities for innovation, reducing redundancies, reducing research and development costs, improving the internal processes of work, reducing mistakes, and engaging workers. Most knowledge management theorists and practitioners describe two fundamental types of knowledge, explicit and tacit knowledge. In general, explicit knowledge is described as knowledge which is externally captured or transferable in either oral or written format, while tacit knowledge is knowledge which exists in people's heads and is difficult to articulate to others, hence the iceberg analogy. To give you a better idea of what these two types of knowledge are, tacit knowledge is the knowledge that employees have a great deal of difficulty communicating and operationalizing, and it is not shared either implicitly or explicitly with others. This type of knowledge can also be described as being based on gut feelings or instincts in which employees are not able to describe exactly what led them to a certain decision or action. Explicit knowledge, on the other hand, is knowledge that is available in tangible form. It often takes the form of best practices or lesson learned documentation that record the observations and recommendations of project leaders and participants. It is important to understand that although this dissection of knowledge is the most common one used by knowledge management educators and practitioners, it's not the only one available to help us understand the subtleties of knowledge. First, the categories of explicit and tacit knowledge have been subdivided in various ways. For example, Kabir describes the following three subdivisions within the category of tacit knowledge. The first is relational, which is knowledge that is subject to interpersonal interaction or attention such as trade secrets. The second is somatic. This is knowledge that's associated with physical movement, such as riding a bicycle. And the third is collective, which is knowledge that is embedded in a certain society or culture, and this could include things like pop culture references. Explicit knowledge has also been subdivided into two forms, explicit and implicit. The difference between these two types of knowledge is their presentation state. While explicit knowledge is already available in tangible form, Implicit knowledge, also known as know-how, is currently stored in employees' heads and is often passed on informally or orally 
but it could be captured in tangible form if needed. This type of knowledge is often shared through job shadowing, in which new employees pick up behaviors from mentors that are not outlined in any explicit training documentation. The line between implicit and tacit knowledge is quite blurred and depends on an individual's ability to articulate and share information that is not physically recorded. One person's tacit information could easily be another's implicit. Others describe different types of knowledge based on their attributes without specifically dividing them into named categories. Brown, Dennis, Burley, and Arlington, for example, describe the following characteristics of knowledge. Teachability, learnability. This refers to the difficulty or ease with which the knowledge can be taught. Items that are difficult to learn are described as having low learnability, and items which are easy to learn are described as having high learnability. Format. This describes the shape that the knowledge takes. These formats can include documents, images, audio materials, or any other of a variety of artifacts. Complexity. The variety of procedural resources that are required to create the knowledge. Knowledge that includes procedures from several different disciplines or tasks are described as having high procedural complexity. Subjectivity. The degree to which the knowledge is open to interpretation by recipients. Observability. The degree to which individuals can replicate knowledge based on their observations of others performing the task or activity. And finally, system dependence, which is the degree to which the knowledge depends on a system, such as a network of people. A body of KM literature has been devoted to exploring the various attributes of knowledge and determining their impact on knowledge transfer behaviors in organizations. For example, Brown, Dennis, Burley, and Arlington in 2013 found that employees were more likely to use person-to-person -person knowledge sharing methods than knowledge management systems for tasks that were high in complexity and teachability. Others have taken the inverse approach and chosen to focus on tasks or activities that individuals perform in a work environment and then categorize these based on the types of knowledge that they require rather than grouping the knowledge. Four types of work have been identified based on their underlying knowledge demands. The first is inacted information, which has high learnability and low tacitness. These are activities such as basic skills that are relatively easy to learn, in which work practices are relatively stable and there is little experience-based expertise. The second category is accumulated information, which has low learnability and low tacitness. These are activities that are more difficult to learn, but still rely primarily on information. These require significant hours of study to master, and often need new information to execute in new work conditions. The third category is apprentice know-how. This has high learnability and high tacitness. Work practices that require the transfer of a high amount of tacit knowledge, but are easy to learn. These tasks are learned by doing, and knowledge is built by experiencing what works and what doesn't. The final category is talent and intuitive know-how, which has low learnability and high tacitness. These are work practices that are difficult to learn and contain a large amount of tacit, unrecorded information. When designing a knowledge management activity, you have to employ a strategy that matches the knowledge needs of the, act of the type of work being undertaken. For example, a set of procedures will work very well for, for a work task that falls into the inactive information category, but poorly for something in the talent or intuitive know-how category. History of Knowledge Management There has been a tendency for some to argue that KM is primarily about technology and rooted in technological solutions. But in reality, it has its roots in several disciplines, including information science and management. Knowledge management established itself as a discipline in the early 1990s, but existed in different forms for some time prior to that. Some of the practices of knowledge management have actually been performed in libraries for centuries. Modern knowledge management practice has been described in phases or stages, with several authors identifying three distinct phases that have occurred since the 1990s. Koning described several phases of KM, with his first one described as by the internet out of intellectual capital, in which organizations realized that they lacked a full understanding of what knowledge exists within their walls, or more specifically within the minds of their employees, and that harnessing that knowledge could be a source of competitive advantage. The focus of this stage was on best practices or lesson learned. The second stage, which he described as the if you build it they will come is a fallacy stage, 
was the point in which organizations discovered that their centrally developed knowledge tools tended to fail because of human factors. This phase focused on the development of communities of practice. The third stage, which is described as the it's no good if they don't use it stage, or the it's no good if they can't find it stage, involved the incorporation of content management strategies such as enterprise content management systems and taxonomies into knowledge management programs. Koenig argues that we are currently entering a fourth stage of KM in which organizations are now becoming aware of the importance of information and knowledge external to the organization. Dalker in 2005 similarly described knowledge management in terms of generations. His first generation was focused on information technologies or knowledge containers. The second focused on people and the question of low usage of digital libraries. And finally, like Koning, he describes the current generation as being focused on, on context, narrative, and content management. These phases represented advancements in learning about what works and what does not in knowledge management and articles containing successful case studies and advice on lessons learned represent a large portion of the knowledge management literature. Barriers to successful knowledge management. Failure is a real risk for knowledge management processes because they often require changes in organizational culture and employee behaviors. Key barriers or challenges that can lead to a failure of a knowledge management project include organizational culture, lack of commitment, lack of incentive, and technological barriers. An organizational culture will influence how open employees are to new initiatives, learning, and knowledge sharing. If an organization does not provide employees with the time or freedom to learn, attempt new projects, and potentially fail, then they may be adverse to trying new things. Additionally, many employees have a tendency to associate knowledge hoarding with job security. They may worry that sharing information or knowledge with others, particularly implicit knowledge, that they develop through years of performing a task may cause them to lose status in the organization or worse could make them replaceable. In terms of lack of commitment, knowledge management projects often involve changes in employee behaviors and task workflows. These may be minor changes such as updating a profile page or being willing to offer advice to coworkers in response to questions relating to their areas of expertise or large changes such as adding a debriefing or documentation step to workflows to allow project information to be documented. Ensuring that these changes take root in an organization requires commitment not only from employees, but also from management, especially at the senior levels. Lack of incentive. Employees have to understand and accept the reasons for participating in a knowledge management initiative. These incentives to participate could include intangible elements such as the elimination of frustration in one's work, such as reduced time to find information and complete tasks or better workflows, recognition of participation through praise or awards, or a connection between knowledge sharing and employee performance measurements. Even if incentives are available and there are benefits to participation in a knowledge management program, if an employee is not aware of them or does not clearly link their contribution to the KM initiative to these benefits, they might as well be absent. And finally, technological barriers. Technological barriers to KM projects can include both the lack of appropriate supporting technology and a lack of understanding on how to use that technology. If a KM technology is not user-friendly or if staff have not been appropriately trained to use it, they are not going to use the tool. Supporting knowledge management. Just as there are several major known barriers to the successful deployment of a corporate knowledge management strategy, there are several elements that are considered to be prerequisites to a KM project's success. These include leadership, organizational culture, learning, and communication and engagement. A successful KM project is one that is supported by leaders at all levels of the organization. This includes senior managers who are willing to lead their organization's culture, structure, and incentive programs in directions that support collaboration and knowledge exchange, middle and frontline managers who work with their employees to ensure that KM is a priority for their team and to develop new ideas for future KM initiatives that are specifically tailored to their workflows, and employees who understand the value of KM and encourage collaboration and knowledge sharing among their peers. Organizational culture. Your organizational culture must have respect for knowledge in order for a knowledge management initiative to be successful. KM must be integrated into business processes rather than simply being an add-on in the last minute. Learning. Knowledge is communicated and learned in different ways. 
A successful KM strategy will not rely on sharing only one type of knowledge across one type of medium. Different media, which can include formats or forums of knowledge sharing, can include written documentation, graphic media, video or audio recordings, communities of practice, social media, and interactions in both live and virtual spaces. Some learning will occur in formal settings, but more will occur informally. Some employees will prefer to be guided by mentors or trainers through material, while others will prefer to have access to resources and the ability to direct their own learning. A KM strategy should be aware of and accommodate different learning styles and preferences. And communication and engagement. A lack of understanding of the significance of the potential benefits of a KM project is a barrier. KM team members must be able to clearly link KM to employee needs in a way that speaks to the employees. The employees must be able to see what's in it for me. Stakeholder involvement from the start of a KM project is vital in ensuring that the right KM initiatives are selected, that they are appropriately implemented, and that employees are willing to participate. And finally, that they are evaluated using appropriate criteria. This stakeholder involvement is tied to a well-developed two-way communication plan. So how can you develop a knowledge management strategy for your organization? Becoming a KM-focused organization happens across multiple steps and includes an implementation of many KM projects, ranging from small initiatives that impact only a single work team to large projects that involve all employees. Although KM and its central values of collaboration and learning must be supported by senior management, KM projects can be proposed and implemented from either a top-down or a bottom-up direction. Implementing a knowledge management program involves causing change within the organization. This change could be in the form of the workflows that people engage in to get things done, for example by introducing a new knowledge management system or reporting requirements, but it could also involve changes in the structure of the organization, such as creating new working groups or communities of practice, or even redesigning formal organizational reporting structures. Because knowledge management involved change, implementing knowledge management requires some understanding of change management. The basic steps in implementing a KM initiative are as follows. Identify the KM need, plan the KM project, implement the pilot or the full project, embed the KM practice, and then evaluate and debrief, which can lead to the circle starting over again. The degree of rigor and number of sub-steps involved in this process may vary depending on the scale of the KM project being proposed. In cases where employees already have ideas about focused KM initiatives that can address specific knowledge transfer or storage needs, the completion of project documentation could be done by a small team and implemented in a short period of time. In cases where entire branches or workflows are being examined to identify potential KM initiatives, the project may involve a larger group of core project members and stakeholder advisors and may require several years to fully implement. Stage 1 is identify the KM need. Identifying the need for a knowledge management project is the first and one of the most important steps of a KM project. Ideally, KM projects should be tailored to address specific knowledge storage or transmission challenges in the organization. In order to tailor a KM solution, the individual workflows and business lines within the organization should each be examined to determine what knowledge they produce or require, how that knowledge is currently transmitted, and if there are any inefficiencies in that knowledge flow or knowledge pieces that are missing. It is recommended that KM be approached strategically by starting with the knowledge projects that have the greatest impact. This means starting with some of the core business activities in the organization. In private sector organizations, this usually includes sales or research and development work. For large-scale knowledge management investigations, the following additional data collection strategies are recommended. Documentation review, focus groups, interviews, and observations. Documentation review involves looking at procedures and training guides related to the workflow before meeting with any staff in that team. This will allow you to understand what language is used and a bit about the background processes. This can allow you to focus in later on questions specifically related to knowledge needs rather than trying to get a basic understanding. With focus groups, these are a good way to hear different perspectives on how knowledge is managed in the workflow. Focus groups could include just the management group, employees who perform the same function within a workflow, or employees who represent the different steps within a workflow. 
multiple focus groups could be conducted within a KM investigation. Interviews with key stakeholders in the workflow to discover their knowledge needs, perceptions of current knowledge transfer mechanisms, and answers to questions about what information is available in the organization are also helpful. These are often a good follow-up based on questions that you have coming out of a focus group, but they could also be done in reverse order, starting with individual interviews and using those uh, to lead to focus group dialogues. And finally, observation. Observing employees engaged in tasks will help you to reveal information about, wor about workflows that might not have been included in the written documentation. It's the best way to discover implicit knowledge. It must be noted that the success of any of these data collection measures will be greatly improved by the participation of a gatekeeper or informant from the team. This will allow you to have access to key materials as well as a way of identifying people to speak with in the future. This gatekeeper could be a member of the management team for the group and it can also serve as a champion for the later initiative once it's proposed. Stage two is to plan the KM project. A KM project plan has three main elements. The development of the KM resource that will be used to capture, organize, or store the information. A project management strategy that will outline deliverables, timelines, and responsibilities. And a plan to encourage employee participation in and acceptance of the project, including strategies for communication, engagement, and training. When it comes to planning the KM piece, the following considerations must be addressed. Transmission method what format should be used to store the information being captured and codified in the project. Even if an informal or oral method is selected, documentation of some kind should be produced as a result of these knowledge exchanges that will need to be captured somewhere for use by future employees. Knowledge transition methods include storytelling, job shadowing or contextual inquiry, interviews, personal productivity tools, ad hoc project teams, storage systems such as case management tools, other KM technologies, and collaborative opportunities which could include either virtual or live meetings. Stage 3 is to implement your pilot or your full project. The third step of the project involves implementing all of the plans that were developed in Stage 2. In cases of a large KM project, a pilot might have been devised as the first step towards full implementation, while small projects might not require a pilot. If a pilot is being deployed, Continue through stages four to five and then return to stage two with any revisions to the full project documentation that were developed as a result of the pilot project. Regular updates should be made throughout the implementation stage. Stage four, embed the KM practice. Because KM projects involve changes in behaviors, they will need to be embedded for new knowledge sharing and behaviors to endure. Anchoring change includes a variety of activities ranging from simple celebrations and recognitions of the achievement of milestones, through to changes in job descriptions and evaluation working plans. Stage five is to evaluate and debrief. After a new project or initiative has been implemented and has been running for a given period of time, it is essential that the project team, including key stakeholders, review and evaluate the project. This review and evaluation can examine not only how well the KM project is running, but how successful the project team was in executing the implementation. Lessons learned from a project can provide valuable guidance to other employees who are seeking to start another KM project. This has been a brief overview of knowledge management for practitioners. There are thousands of articles available in information technology, management, and library science journals that can provide case studies and advice on how to implement knowledge management programs and systems in a variety of settings. In addition, I, I invite you to join me at the 2014 Canadian Library Association Conference in Victoria, BC for a presentation on how to move from librarianship to knowledge management. Thank you.